May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. So I, uh, I love this story of a priest who was taking a walk in the neighborhood of the church and he sees this little boy trying to reach a doorbell and he's desperately trying to ring this bell, but he can't, he can't reach it. And so the priest kind of stands there and, and watches for a while while this kid struggles and then decides that he's gonna help him out. So he walks up and he gives, the priest gives the doorbell a good solid ring and then he crouches down on the level of this little boy and he says, and now what, my little friend? And the boy says, now we run. <laughs> well, friends, uh, today's the second Sunday of Advent. And if you've been following the Advent devotional that Sarah so artfully put together for us, uh, you'll notice that this whole past week, with the lighting of the first candle, uh, we were remembering specifically the Christian idea and subject of hope. Each of the Advent candles stands for something. Hope, peace, joy, and then love. Love, right, Sarah? I think so, that's the fourth one. Um, and so I've been this whole week thinking about this idea of hope, kind of reflecting on the questions that Sarah put in the devotional for us, and, um, and kind of noticing around me what you know how hope is absorbed talking about it to the kids and the family and I wanted today to offer a, a brief reflection on the subject of hope and I just want to tell you up front I there's no way I, that I can or anyone can do the subject of Christian hope justice in a single sermon um, and so I'm gonna just offer some thoughts and I, I believe that they will stir some things for you to talk about and think about uh, with your loved ones and as you meditate through uh, the rem remainder of this season. So, hope. Uh, in the reading that Rachel so wonderfully read uh, in just a few moments ago, uh, we heard these words from Paul in the letter to the Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Clearly, we get the sense that hope is something that is um, that we are meant to experience in abundance as followers of Christ. And I want to begin with a question to you today, a personal question, um, and that is, where in your life right now do you need hope the most? Where in your life do you need hope the most? Where have you been tempted to despair? Or to give up? Where do you need hope? So I want to give us an example of what we're not talking about when we talk about hope. So I, um, I'm not a sports fan except for every four years. And, um, and I've been consuming uh, the FIFA World Cup. And I noticed the other day during one of the games, uh, uh, they were closing, bring, doing a close-up on the um, on people in the stands, and there was someone, one of the fans was standing there like this, praying as, you know, the teams were playing. And, and I, I was thinking, you know, again, I was, I've been thinking about hope this whole week, and I was just like, surely that's not what hope is. Uh, and, and the reason I share that is because hope is very different than optimism or likelihood, or the odds, right? So any team, as you, as you know if you've been following the World Cup, any team can all of a sudden bring out a magic goal out of nowhere and turn things around. So that, that's more like chance, and, and I'm not sure that God necessarily is up there orchestrating whether Ghana is gonna beat, you know, who else, or whatever. So um, what we're not talking about is optimism. So for example, this glass, um, is this half full or half empty? What do you guys think? Just out of curiosity. What's your lens? So the optimistic perspective is looking at this and saying this is half full, right? And there's always going to be the optimist. I could bring the water lower and lower 
uh, and someone could still say, well, there's still a lot of water in there, it's plenty. So that's optimism, is this idea that you are um, taking a look at uh, uh, a positive outlook on the world. But what, what Christian hope is, is something very different. I don't have a place to pour this out, and I don't want to ruin these plants. But if I could show you an empty glass, we would say that even the most optimistic person, the most enthusiastic optimist would say, okay, it's empty. And, uh, and if that was an illustration for those situations in life where truly it feels like there's nothing good that's going to come out of it, Christian hope says the glass will be filled again. That's what hope is. So it's not, yeah, it's like half full or the odds are good. It's when there is nothing, when there's emptiness, when there's no hope from the perspective of the world. And, and the Christian hope is, says, there's still hope. The, the glass will be filled again. So Christian hope is something that searches for what is deeper um, and more significant. That, that type of hope that stands the test of human experience. Not just, you know, the odds are good that things are going to turn out okay. But what do you do when things look bleak? So um, G.K. Chesterton, um, he encapsulated this when he said that hope means that you hope when things are hopeless. I know that sounds weird, but hang with me for a moment. As long as matters are hopeful, Chesterton says, hope is mere platitude or flattery. We're just talking about, you know, I hope things go out, turn out well. It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength. And I want to kind of lean a little bit more into this idea today about this prophetic type of hope, one that speaks to the real human experience, a deep and abiding conviction that in spite of the evidence to the contrary, all things will be made whole. So hope is a really tricky thing, actually, and, and it's complex, because if we're not careful, what we end up doing is pausing on our joy and fulfillment in life, thinking about a future time when things will be better. And this is, this is where it gets so dangerous when we talk about hope, is I hope things will be better. It deprives us of fully living in the present and in the moment, because things will be better at some point, and I'll be happy, I'll be fulfilled. And, and this is where we start to get the sense that hope can actually start to trip us up. And, 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 I, I, and my, my point today and my focus is to just clarify what we talk about when we talk about Christian hope. So if we think of hope as something that interrupts us from living fully in the present and just thinking about a future time when things will be better, that type of hope ends up being a handicap to our, um, uh, our full and abundant life that Jesus invited us to. So let me just go back for a moment to that question that I asked you, and I'm going to come back to it one more time after this. But where in your life could you use hope most? And I want to ask you, in your current circumstance right now, are you in a season of waiting to actually be joyful or feel fulfilled or feel like you're going to live again once what it is that you're waiting for happens? Is that where you are? Because I want to encourage you today to think about hope differently. That hope isn't something that we pause our lives for and, 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 and lets us to not live in the present because we're waiting for something else. Christian hope is very different. Christian hope, believe it or not, invites us to live even more fully in the present. What do I mean by this? So kind of the way the world thinks of hope is something has to change in order for me to be fulfilled. That's kind of the way we think of, usually we think of hope. Christian hope says not something has to change, something has changed. Something has changed so I can now live fully present here and now knowing that things will not always be this way. 
This is the most important and significant nuance, friends, and let me just say it one more time. So hope isn't something has to change in order for me to be fulfilled. Hope, Christian hope, is something has changed, and it's huge. And, and now I get to live fully present here and now, knowing that things won't always be this way. And so when we say, well, what has changed? Um, one of my former, uh, uh, it, this is a seminary professor who died right before I, I went to seminary, but when I say former, it's because many of the books that we read in seminary were by him. His name is Lewis Smeads. And, uh, and he said this, he said that, uh, he asked the question, is there hope when hope is taken away? Is there hope when the situation is hopeless? He says that question leads us to the Christian idea of hope. For in the Bible, hope is no longer a passion for the possible. It becomes a passion for the promise. And what he's touching on is the same thing that I'm talking about here. Something has already happened. What is this promise that has already taken place. And, and for us as Christians, our promise is what Jesus did with the resurrection. That is the promise that brought hope to the life of the world. So what does the resurrection tell us? It tells us that life wins. It tells us that life conquers death. Um, the resurrection tells us that justice overcomes injustice. This is like the ultimate um, outcome that, that happened, and, and, and forever we are living in that reality of, of not yet, and yet we're there. We're still waiting on it, and yet it's already happened. Love wins. Love conquers all. So that's the promise. It's already happened. So I can live fully right now, fully present to the moment, knowing that justice has already overcome injustice. What an amazing thought when you think about the world, when you turn the news on, or you think about your own life, and you say, love has already won. Justice has already, already conquered. Life wins. All things will be made whole. That is the promise. And so I can live fully present now to this moment. I was talking to uh, a, a friend who is a, a real wisdom bearer in my life this week. And he said something that blew my mind. I've never actually thought about this. And I'll share it with you today as I continue to, to process it and let it kind of take root in my own life. But this is what he said. He said, I know that when I die, I'm going to die incomplete. I know that when I, I die, I'm going to die incomplete. Because completion is not a, pro, a promise in this life. I'm going to die incomplete. So I'm not seeking perfection in my life. I am seeking to be faithful. What do you think about that? What do you think about the fact that when you die, all these, hopefully you live a nice long life, that when you die, you will still be incomplete upon your death? How do you feel about that? And what does that mean for the way that you live right now? So he says, I'm not seeking perfection. I know I'm always going to be incomplete, always pursuing that, that sense of completeness, and I'll never actually reach it. And so what I seek to do is to live faithful right now. So where is it in your life that you need hope the most? And what does it mean to stay faithful right now? What does it look like to stay steadfast in hope? I'm going to wrap this up and then, uh, with one, one more quote, and then I'm going to offer a prayer for us. St. Augustine once said that hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain the way they are. And so, again, what we're not talking about is complacency. We're talking about the kind of hope that says things have changed thanks to the cross and the resurrection. I can live fully present now, but I'm not going to just be complacent and say that someday things will be whole. That when Paul says that may you abound in hope, what he's talking about is an overflowing of hope from our world to the world around us. So we fight. We fight for what is not right, and we continue to bring about that beautiful reality of hope that we wait for.
Let's pray together. Loving God, this is a very personal message for so many of us right now, this desire for hope in our lives. God, you see each of us here, the need for healing, the desire for recovery. God, the, the chance to live again after the loss of a loved one. So many ways in which we connect with hope. And so I pray, God, today that you would somehow, in your special way, show us that, Lord, life has already conquered. And teach us how to live in that life, fully present here and now, so that we experience every bit of this beautiful and sacred life that you've given us a chance to live. Bless us now, and thank you for winning the battle for us. In your name we pray.